installment agreement. There's in-business trust fund installment agreements. There's streamlined installment agreements. There's the offer and compromise. You know, this somebody's going to lend me money and, and to pay off this liability if you're willing to give me a deal on that. Um, and there's just waiting until the statute of limitations expire. So the, that's the big overview. All right. The the takeaway from the big overview is. The IRS notice that the taxpayer believed it was sent to you isn't fixed in stone. The amount is not fixed in stone, and the fact that they're going to take your assets is not fixed in stone. You, you, you got to check the validity assessment. You got to check the amount of the assessment, and then you've got to figure out: Do I really have to pay it all back? Right? So that's what collection practice is. Now, how and when do you do it? That's going to be based on where you are in the process. So the next thing I want to cover quickly is the IRS notices and what do they mean and what should you be doing when you see the IRS notices. All right. So the IRS is, starts the process with an assessment of tax. What is an assessment of tax? The assessment of tax is the recordation of the liability on the books and records of the IRS. How does that happen? All right. One, in many cases, you're going to file a tax return. Right? The tax return is called self-assessing. That's why you've heard me describe voluntarily compliant self-assessing taxpayers as what the ideal is. Voluntarily compliant, the taxpayer does it on its own. Self-assessing, that they're figuring out the tax and the correct tax. They're not saying, IRS, I made a dollar. This is my offer. What's your counter? All right, that's not... You know, ideally, in an ideal world, that's not the way it works. The return is not the first offer to the government. It's your good faith estimate of what the correct tax is. Right? So the IRS begins the process with the assessment. Right? How else do assessments occur? After audit. Right? All returns are not perfect. There are some returns that are selected for audit. That number of returns is out down to less than 1%. Right? So most tax is self-assessed tax, but for the 1% or less than 1% of tax returns that are audited, the IRS assesses an additional liability after the return is filed. It's okay? proposed. It could be proposed. No, it's assessed once you sign an assessment or a 90-day letter passes and you don't petition the tax court or the tax court enters a decision and then the IRS assesses the tax as redetermined by the IRS. So the, the IRS can only collect based on a valid assessment, an assessment made within the statute of limitations, right? Anything else, I mean, except for jeopardy assessments, which are assessments that are made when they believe that the IRS is, that the taxpayer is about to flee the country or dissipate assets to preclude the valid collection, is based on this process. And this process is what lets us help the taxpayer. It's what gives us the ability to negotiate for the correct tax. All right? So the first thing, once you get an assessment, before you even get all these other notices and demands, if your taxpayer can't pay, you can ask for an extension of time to pay. It's in a form, it's an 1127. And either when you're filing the return, or when you are about to get a notice of deficiency or you get your first notice, you file your 1127 and that says, guys, payment now is going to be a hardship, but I'm about to get involved in a championship fight and I'm going to get this $100 million purse. So if you wait for that, I can pay you. Floyd Mayweather. Yeah. Are we not talking about real cases here? Yeah. But it's a hypothetical. Maybe I'm going to get a hundred million dollar fight. Somebody wants to pay me. And you know, you'd say, look, the, the payment now would be a hardship. I'd have to liquidate assets. I would generate a tax liability on the liquidation of the assets. But I got this money coming in, right? So, so, the, and the IRS has a form for that, right? In, in, um, it's. You can get a six-month extension of payment on the for the original return. You can get up to 18 months on a 
deficiency, and then the IRS has the discretion to give another year after that. Now what does that do? This It just means that the failure to pay penalties aren't going to apply, and that the IRS has given you an extension of time to pay. So you're not in violation of law, you're not going to get a lien, the IRS has consensually given you an extension of time. Most of these are requested in estate tax cases, and in estate tax cases, you use the form 4768. But on income and gift tax cases, you're going to use your 1127, right? And that's your first thing that you do. And most of these overviews, I think the newsletter article tomorrow is going to summarize all your collection alternatives so you don't have to take like super notes. But that's your first step. Is this a short-term problem? And if it's a short-term problem, six months, a year, and, but you see that there's hope on the horizon, think of your extension of time to pay. Um, and every businessman says, you know, prosperity is just around the corner. Uh, but after that, right, you're going to get your notice. Uh, what are your notices, right? You, you, the IRS has the, the, the notices. First is the notice and demand for payment tax. That's the one that tells you, hey, we've assessed the tax against you. Right? That's important because absent the assessment, the IRS can't take any of the enforced collection activities, right? That's the stuff that you hear about, you know, on the infomercials, pennies on the dollar, you know, they've seized your bank account, they came, they took your car, you know, all of those, those millions and millions of seizures and levies. That, that can't be done unless the IRS has followed some of these steps. Next is the, the 501, you've received the 501. It's just a nice reminder. All right. Then there's gonna be a second notice then there's going to be one that's urgent. And then there's one that's really ominous, final. And so what's on the final notice? It says, if you don't respond to this one, we're going to take your stuff. What are we going to take? We're going to take your wages. We're going to take your bank accounts. We're going to take your social security. But it says right on it, a parade of horribles, that if you don't respond. And what happens? Most people don't respond. <laughs> I, it, I think they said the studies say that uh, less than 5% of the people respond to the notice that says, final, we're going to take your stuff. It says, how long do you have to respond? 30 days. If you're in the middle of a really busy tax season, will the IRS understand they give you like 60 days? No, 30 days means 30 days. Then they start taking your taxpayer's stuff. So what do you do with each of the notices, okay? Because they each have important consequences on your response or your non-response. All right, the first notice is your notice and demand for payment, all right? What's the importance of this notice? It means the assessment's made, all right? Without an assessment, can the IRS file a federal tax lien against your assets as it goes on a credit report? Nope. And what happens if it's a bad assessment? They gotta withdraw the liens. Right, because they, all of this is based on a good assessment. So that's why I say you're going to get the transcripts of account. You're going to calculate. Do we got a good assessment here? Because if you can defeat the assessment, game over. They can't do the rest of the stuff. All right, interest, um, interest on the trust fund recovery penalty, employment taxes, doesn't start until the IRS sends the notice to the taxpayer's last known address. Many of these cases settle in appeals because the IRS can't prove that they sent the notice to the last known address. Right. All right. What are, here's just in the materials and in the outline, the, you're going to see these are what the notices look like. Practice point. You've got to read the notices. Right. The IRS just redesigned lots of notices. Um, I'm going to be speaking at the uh, IRS forums and I'm going to tell you about everything that went into the redesign of the notices. They went to psychi psychologists, you know, they, they, they worded the notices in a way that is going to prompt the response that they want, which is pay the tax. The problem is that lots of lawyers and people look at the notices and say, hey, the psychology of the form is great. Advising the taxpayer of their rights, not so great. Right? So like some of the things that you can do if you disagree are buried on the second page of some of these notices. Um, you, you have to read the notices, especially once they change. After you a while, you'll understand the notices and you've seen them, but the IRS is redesigning a lot of them. 
So even if you've been doing this for a long time, you gotta read the notices. The new notice of deficiency doesn't look like the old notice of deficiency. You could easily confuse it for a notice that was pre the old notice of deficiency. All right, so what do we do? One, how do you get the IRS to recognize you once you're representing a taxpayer that you got a notice? That's when you file your 2848, right? Without 2848, the IRS doesn't want to talk to you, all right? If you don't want to represent the taxpayer, you just want to get the information, there's an 8821 that could be filed. Um, then once you file your 2848, you go to e-services, you get the transcripts that are available on e-services, which your wage and income, your account, and your tax return transcripts. I get the tax return transcripts. It's not that infrequent that the return that the taxpayer gives me may be the one that he gave to either to get his bank loan and then it was more money or to get his kid a student loan and then it's less money and <laughs> you know and there's multiple drafts in the file and we should all work with the draft or the one that actually got filed with the IRS all right so that's a good place to start and how many of you seen IDRs that ask you for the taxpayer's tax return? Right? Many IDRs today. The, the first question the IRS asks you for is, give us the tax return. Don't send them the wrong one. <laughs> That's always a bad thing. Right? So, trust but verify. Get the tax return transcripts, even if you have the tax return. Then you verify, hey, at this first notice, this is the things where I said you're gonna verify, verify, verify. Verify that the notice of deficiency is based on the tax return that you got. Confirm that the assessment was made within the three-year assessment statute. Confirm that the IRS isn't trying to collect beyond the 10-year collection statute. And that's just math, all right? On the transcript account, the tax return date filed, the, um, the, the, when they assessed any additional tax, and you know the date, 10, 120 months from the date the tax return was filed. If those numbers don't work, then you may have problems. The other thing you gotta verify is their interest computation, right? There's a section of the code, 6404G, that says if the IRS doesn't notify you of a change to the tax return, within three years of the filing of the return, interest stops running, right? Many of you have seen like tax shelter cases and old cases out, well tax shelter is a bad example because that's accepted from there, but you're seeing older cases out there where the exam is taking a long time. And what happened during the exam? They asked you for an extension of the statute of limitations, right? Has anybody ever signed an extension of statute of limitations? All right, now if you signed an extension of statute of limitations, do you think that the interest continued to run if they didn't give you a report? Now, that's why you look at 6404G. Interest is suspended, right? Uh, if the IRS hasn't given you that report for the period after the three years till they give you the report. So you always want to check the interest computation, right? There are accounting firms in, in, with big taxpayers uh, where you know, that's all they do. They take these cases on the contingent fee and they make a nice amount of money based on figuring out that the IRS interest computations are not correct. Uh, then one of the other things, why do you get transcripts of accounts to confirm that your taxpayer is current in his compliance? If he's not current in his compliance, uh, make sure that he is current in his compliance. Why? Most of the collection alternatives are going to require your taxpayer be current in the payment of his or her tax, right? So, um, if your taxpayer hasn't filed his returns, you're going to say, hey, let's get them filed. Oh, I don't, I'm not required to file. Then file returns that are zero returns, right? That especially now where, you know, there's a, a new offering compromise policy where if the taxpayer's not current, they're going to send you back the offering compromise, but they're going to keep the taxpayer's money. How embarrassing is that going to be if you submit an offer, right? and you don't know he's not current, they send you back in there. Then you're gonna fight with the IRS about, oh, he wasn't required to file a return or not. 
It's so much easier to just check the transcript and put in the dollar returns. So you're not taking that risk of getting the offer uh, and compromise returned to you, right? That's gonna undermine the taxpayer's trust in your ability to move this case forward. And the, what you're gonna find with these taxpayers is they, they don't like being in this situation. They owe money, they, they have the federal tax lien. They're, they're seeing you because the, the lien is strangling them. They can't get credit for their business. They can't get a student loan. They can't do whatever it is that they want you to fix. And the minute you do something wrong, they're gonna start blaming you for every problem in your life, in their lives. So you wanna make sure that every step of the way, you've minimized the, the ability for them to blame you for what the IRS is doing or blame you for the problems in their lives. So just make sure that they're in compliance. Then I said file your Freedom of Information Act request so you get all of the files. And one of the most important forms right now, very hotly litigated form, is whether the IRS signed the penalty memo. There's a memo required before they assess a penalty under Section 6751B, right? There are some cases that are coming out now saying if the IRS didn't follow their own rules and sign this penalty abatement form, they have to abate the penalties. I mean, penalty assessment form. They have to abate the penalties, right? And uh, that's hotly litigated. There's judges who are all over the place. But one of the things you should always do today is you get your Freedom of Information Act request and look to see if that form was signed. Because in some cases, just pointing out to the IRS that, that that form wasn't signed means that they're either gonna abate the penalty or they're gonna negotiate with you on the penalty from a different place. Yes, sir. Okay, from the first line to the last line, about how much time has gone by? About 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> right, the judge is gonna tell you. Oh, from... <laughs> the cap you're just gonna you're gonna sign in fax in the transcripts i use something called the um, uh, audit detective i get them in 15 minutes i'm gonna get my transcripts in 15 minutes and i review them pretty quick uh but because they have a nice little report that audit detective does that puts it in the format so i can know what's going on uh, so I, I can verify that number on the three years, and actually the audit detective report codes it, saying you should look at this, the statute may be gone. So the audit detective makes this part, this slide one part, like, you know, tax for dummies. Um, the only part that takes a little longer is the Freedom of Information Act request. Getting it out, the, you know, we get that out within 24 hours of the client being um, you know, signed up, and it generally takes about six weeks to get it back. It takes about a week for to hit the cap. Yes, the, the cap one. That's why the, the shortcut. In the old day, the, there's two ways to get it. One is from e-services by putting it on cap. Two is just by calling it in, calling over, it, and you fax it, and then they'll send you your transcripts that same day. All right, so what happens? So in that five to, five to six weeks later, we're gonna get a, a, a reminder notice. That's going to be your notice and demand. But we've already started the process right. They know who we are. Right? We've, we, this is your 501. You're going to send them a letter. Right? Um, the first, so what, what is, if you haven't sent them in already, you're going to send them your, your 2848. You're going to start evaluating your collection alternatives, which is, you know, getting from the tax for everything to fill out their CIS, which is the, the Form 433 series, there's the Form 433A, there's the Form 433B for the businesses, and there's the Form 43F. You're going to start looking at the, the financial information because that's going to guide you as to where you're going. You know, currently not collectible, installment agreement, offer and compromise. You're going to send a letter to the IRS uh, saying, do not file a federal tax lien. Okay. The IRS, the I, and this is, yes? This may be a nuisance question, but I have yes. a lot of low income taxpayers mm -hmm. maybe owe $500. Yep. They can't pay. Okay. To do an installment is $100 more. No, because you're going to call, you're going to get a waiver. Oh. Right? 
if they can't, then one of the things I, I, in all of our cases where if our, well then, then they can pay $500 no. or $100. Yeah, it comes down to if they are low income enough to, that we're going to be asking for CNC, we should be asking for them, the IRS to waive the fees. The other part of it is, is the back door installment agreement, right? Okay. We, we, you've gone through this process, right? If we answer every request for the IRS, how many years do we get? All right. Minimum, I could keep a case going five years. You know. I did keep one case going 40 years, right? Um, so, look, you start with your your request to postpone the payment of tax, right? That could be six months to 18 months. Then they've got to go through all these notices. Then you can request your collection due process hearing. That's Now we, we're in year three. Then your collection due process hearing, if the IRS doesn't... Uh, see it our way, we're going to tax court. That's going to get us to year five. Then if we lose in the tax court, we're going to go to the Court of Appeals. That's going to be year seven. All right. If during this whole time I am paying $10 a month, by the time we're done, I won't have to pay the application fee. I've just voluntarily sent the money in and used the system to get me a free installment agreement. So knowing all your deadlines and how long things take will help you decide how to do this in the most cost-effective way for the clients, right? When intact, right? It's all of these people have no money. Right? They're coming to us because they can't pay. So, and that's why when you look at the materials, I've given you the free websites the free offer and compromise thing, where you can do free legal research so that we can represent all these people that have no money at no cost to them other than our time, right? And our time, I'm hoping it's a win-win, that we're learning the system, we're getting better so that we can represent our paying clients more effectively. But that, that, that's the goal, right? But yes, if you know the system, you will never have to pay any of the IRS user fees. So, the, the, back to the letter filing the 2848, right? The liens are, are fought in two different ways, right? There's your pre-lien filing and your post-lien filing CTP. Pre-lien filing, right? If before the IRS files that notice of federal tax lien, you say you want to exercise your cap rights, which are your pre-lien filing rights, then you're going to get the right to talk to the compliance person, which generally called a revenue officer. You have a conference with their group manager. That happens within 48 hours. And then you will get an appeal to the Office of Appeals. And that's on a rocket dock. It happens in five days. In maybe 10% of the cases, you can convince them that the filing of the notice of federal tax lien will create a hardship. All right? So you want to take that shot. Some taxpayers, if the lien gets filed, they lose their job, right? Brokers, sometimes some construction companies, the lien gets filed, they don't get bonding. So there are some cases where you're going to put the fight on. You're going to say, IRS, you file that lien, you guaranteed that you don't get paid because my guy loses his job. And in some cases, that works. So. If, if this is a taxpayer where the lien is going to create the hardship, they're not going to be able to rent an apartment, right? More and more landlords want credit checks, and they see that tax lien on it, it's going to be issued determinative, right? You are going to press for your pre-CDP lien hearings, even though the chance of success is not great. You know, because all you need to do is get the one guy who says, there but for the grace of God go I. This is a hardship. Look, filing this lien doesn't give the, any, the government anything because he's got so many other judgments ahead of him. Right? Whatever your argument is, because that's what we do. We tell the taxpayer's story. Right? We tell, ask the IRS, don't do anything that gives you nothing and makes their life worse. So that, that's why you want to make sure that it's there. 
uh, because the IRS doesn't necessarily tell you about these pre-lien rights. They're in the IRM, all right? But most taxpayers aren't going to be going online to irs.gov and finding Chapter 5 of the IR, you know, the collection manual saying, hey, where are my cap rights? Okay. So this is, this is something that's not written any place, but you've got to do it. So then, then you get to the next notes. All right, the next note is CP503. Another five weeks have passed. Uh, it's now a reminder, it's time you got your interest in your penalties, right? Your CP503, that's what they look like. All right. Now, this is your brief. This is now, you know, sometimes when you want to slow things down, this is where you're going to start submitting your collection alternative, right? Um, so. You've got your 433, you've got your 433B. This is where you're going to decide, hey, am I going for PPIA? Am I going for an offer and compromise? Do I want time? Submitting the offer and compromise at this time is sometimes the right thing to do because it stops all collection. And sometimes that's what you need. You need the time to stop all the collection. If the IRS accepts the offer, that's great. If not, you're still going to have all your CDP rights intact. So this may be the right time, as opposed to waiting, to file your offer and compromise. All right, uh, what else are you gonna do? Again, you're gonna protect your cap rights, you're gonna make sure that they have your, your 2848, you're gonna decide what your collection alternative you're gonna start. All right, the fourth notice, this is, uh, they, they, they have to send before they can levy, they have to send you this notice. This notice is a tricky notice. It says, we're going to grab your state tax refund. That means it's not your CDP notice. It's not your final notice. But it is your notice that, hey, time is running out. All right. So your response is, this is where you're going to finalize. If, you're going to, if you want to get your pre-CDP offering compromise in, this is where you submit it. Right? This is where you may want to do your installment agreement request because you know once you're on the road to your CDP, that's going to be a lot of a lot of more a lot more formal procedures go in place. All right. That's another five weeks. Now we're going to get to the, the notices that have lots of legal significance, and you can't forget about the time frames. You got to calendar everything. Now. Okay. The 1058, which is called your final notice, your LT11, that's similar to your, your uh, 1058. And your 3172 is, we filed the federal tax lien. Now, yet in order to get it uh, withdrawn or released, you're going to have to go through the CPP procedures. Right? In some ways, that's a loss because now it's filed. Your taxpayer is, is starting to feel strangled. They're gonna be giving you calls every other week. When is this lien going away? I'm trapped. I can't borrow in my business. I can't earn money. I can't buy a, a, a new car. I can't rent. You know, we're gonna look and say, hey, what you're proposing to do, that would be a hardship to me and my family. All right. And I have an alternative. Right? As, excuse me? What, what section? 6343B. Again, if you read the article tomorrow, the only, I'm not an encyclopedia. I just wrote and reviewed the article before we did this today. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> no, my memory is that good. Right? You test me on any code sections. Pull them up. You know. <laughs> Uh, was that a test? No. Um, collection alternatives. And so then you're going to say, Iris, the things you're proposing to do, that would harm my family. That's not what government should do. This is how I propose to do it. Sometimes it's, hey, let's forget about the past. All right? See and see. And if I had to pay anything to the, toward the past, I, I wouldn't be able to make my necessary living expenses. Let's forget about the past. Let's call me currently not collectible, but I promise to be good going forward, right? That's a collection alternative, right? Um, sometimes it's installment agreement. Sometimes it's offering compromise, right? The collection alternatives, you know, there's some that are defined by the code, but others 
You know, they're not. Be creative, right? In some cases, when the tr uh, there's a trust fund recovery penalty cases, I've said, hey, the rich guys, they were already paying it on an installment agreement. Collect from them. Why don't you just suspend your action against me to see if they pay it off? Because you can't collect it more than once. So let's get it from them. Right? We do that, I mean, again, it's you have to understand the facts, understand the case, and then propose what you think is appropriate for your facts and circumstance, and then be willing to litigate it out or push it, right? I mean, the IRS, over 90% of collection due process cases settle. Very few of them actually get to court. So it'll tell you that appeals is gonna to listen to any reasonable, rational offer that can fit within the parameters of the IRM and their collection materials. Um, and if you don't go there, you go to court, right? Spousal defenses, this is where you would say, hey, maybe the right answer is collect it from the husband because you know I can't make it, we're divorced. And he promised when we got divorced that he was gonna pay this. So it would be wrong, it would not be equitable because I took less in the divorce because he said he was gonna pay this for you to chase me. Right, the IRS, their initial reaction is gonna be, but we weren't a party to the divorce. How could you make a deal for our liability? And you're not saying, we're not telling you you don't know, we don't know, we, we're telling you that we made a deal and he, I took less and I'm gonna be hurt if you don't try to collect it from him because he has a contractual obligation to pay you under the divorce agreement, right? There's a nuance to the argument. Um, and, so, and the final thing is that you say, look, Iris, the code requires you to balance the need for the efficient collection of tax with the legitimate concern that collection is no more intrusive than necessary. And this is how you deal with the fact where the IRS says, hey, you have equity in this piece of property. Why don't you sell it? We don't want to give you the installment agreement. We want you to sell your property. And you're back, you go back and say, or take the money out of your pension plan. And your argument is, that's not a good balance because although you need the money fast, if, you, if we liquidate this asset to pay you, now we've created a new tax liability, right? We take it out of the pension plan, we got a new liability. That we sell an asset, we got a new liability. Or it's gonna sell at fire sale because you have this lien. So Let us let have... The money first. What? Let the first on the pension plan, then there's no... I don't wanna do that. I'd rather pay them out over time. Levy on a pension plan? I mean, one, it's tax, right? Two, I don't want to pay the additional tax because I want to take that ta money out when I retire. I want to take that money out when I'm moving to a tax, a state that doesn't tax pensions, right? You got to balance the government's needs for the money. And what is the government's need for the money? There's something called the six-year rule. Who knows what the six-year rule is, right? If you can pay the liability within six years, you're going to look, this is in the materials, that that's an acceptable collection alternative. So if you can propose a payment plan that full pays the tax within six years, that's a good collection alternative. That, that's in the articles that we've sent around. It's now in the IRM. You look it up. It's, called, it's on the IRS website. It's called the six-year rule. All right, so rather than sell an asset and create a new liability, if you could propose a plan that's gonna pay it out over six years. Now, is it six years from the time that you filed the return? No, because when, by the time we're at CDP, where are we really, all right? We asked for the extension of time to pay, that was six months to 18 months. Then we went through the process, now we're here at CDP, so we're really, in most of the time we're asking this at year three or year four, so it's really 10 years from the original assessment of the tax. And that's just, you're gonna pay it off just within the statute of limitations, all right? And that is an acceptable collection alternative rather than forcing you to sell an asset that would create and generate a bigger tax liability, all right? So these are all parts of what you're gonna be, and again, this is a very short overview of the things you're thinking about during this process about what the goals of CDP are. All right, what, what's the time? I, want to, I think it's a good time for the break. It's eight o'clock. Good, let's, let's take a... Seven.
10 episodes. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we're going to get started there. Because then this is going to be long and hard. I'll have your, uh, my life. Now, now we're going to go through nuts and bolts. The reason I took a break is now we're actually going to go through the nuts and bolts of the financial statements that the IRS looks at, right? Yeah. All of your collection alternatives, right, that we talked about, other than verifying the assessment, all of your alternatives, whether you go currently not collectible, whether you're going for a short-term or a long-term installment agreement, whether you're going offer and compromise, they're all going to be evaluated based on what the IRS calls a collection information statement. Right? The collection information statement is the IRS's 433 series. All right, in the 433 series is the 433A for individuals, the 433B, the 433 F, which is a short form 433 that's used mostly by the service centers, um, and the 433 OIC. Okay. Um, like tax returns, it's not just about putting numbers in the boxes. It's about presenting the taxpayer's case and presenting the facts in a way that will support your requested collection alternative. So although this may be a little tedious, we're going to go through this the same way you'd go through it at one of these boot camps, because you know, once you have a good foundation, then you can build all the other collection alternatives. So again, the 433A is the one that is required if you owe more than $50,000. If you owe less than $50,000, you can sometimes use the 433F. All right. What is the IRS going to ask you to do before you do a 433? They're going to ask you one, you know, can you full pay this tax? Do we really need to be going down the road of an installment agreement? And as we've seen, like, there's a form to say, hey, if you full pay the tax, we can wipe out the failure to pay penalties, the late payment penalties. So they're going to talk to you about that. They're also going to say, why do you want to go through this? If you can, you've got equity in your assets, maybe you want to borrow against your assets. Uh, and they'll talk to you about foregoing the filing of the lien to see if you can borrow from your assets first. Uh, then we're going to talk about installment agreements, offers and compromise and currently not collected. So one of the things to remind you is the 433 is signed under penalties of perjury. And you've got to remind your taxpayer of that because recently there's been a number of prosecutions of taxpayers who've submitted false 433s, right? I started out by joking around about, you know, the, how many drafts of tax returns do I see? You know, the draft that went to the, for student loans, people make less. They went to the bank, they made more, they went to the IRS. Hopefully that was the sweet spot, the right answer. Um, 433s come that way too. Okay. I've seen 433s with the taxpayer knows. Look, the more you show, the more the IRS is going to want. Or if we show everything, the IRS might grab those assets. So what taxpayers do is they lie on the 433. Um, you know, the IRS is nationwide. If you have a vacation house in Pennsylvania or Florida, they're going to find it. So just saying, hey, we're going to limit the 433 to what I have in the United States or in New Jersey. First, it's New Jersey, right? It used to be the taxpayers thought that the IRS couldn't find Pennsylvania or Florida. All right, now we got computers, they find Pennsylvania or Florida. Now, more recently, it's been well, what about my vacation house in Nicaragua? Okay, more and more, the IRS is international. You got FATCA, you got treaties. So even international assets are coming up. So you can't say, hey, I moved all my assets to Hong Kong. The IRS isn't gonna be able to collect them. So they should take what I'm willing to pay, what I'm willing to keep here. Right? That's not working. And if, if you lie, there have been prosecutions of taxpayers 
who submitted false 433s, right? And falsity can be false because it's literally false, or false could be, you know, people who put false mortgages on a piece of property. Look, I want to get rid of the equity, so I had my brother put a mortgage on the property, so it looked like I had no equity, right? Or I said I didn't own anything because right before I did the 433, I transferred everything to my wife and my children, right? Those are all things that could cause a 433 to be false. Or you don't want, I've got a personal injury suit going, and you know when the PI suit comes in, I'm gonna have lots of money, but I don't want to give it to the IRS. You know, th those are all examples of false and misleading 433s that will get the taxpayer and the preparer in a lot more trouble. So before you do a 433, we trust but verify. Okay, the taxpayer is incentivized to leave assets off. And maybe sometimes they forget. I had a taxpayer who forgot a $1 million bank account. <laughs> and he was just, you know, I had put it away for my retirement. You know, we were filling this stuff out. I know I was in your office two or three times, but Frank, I really forgot. A million dollars? And it was important that I believe him. So, trust the verify. What do we do? How do we do it? One, you know, the Westlaw searches, or all of us have the, you've seen these people searches, public record searches. If you don't have a subscription service, they, they charge you some money, you know, $29, $39 to do all of these searches, lawsuit searches, lien searches. If somebody is suing your client, you want to know why they're suing. Because if they're suing and they're spending money on lawyers, they must think that there's money there to get. Right? So you want to read about the other lawsuits, what's going on. Um, credit reports. Again, how do people get trapped? I've had numbers of people who get trapped where they show they have no income, but they have twenty to 50000 a month balances on their credit cards that get paid off all the time. How does that happen? Oh, you know, I, I asked my client. I said, how does that happen? He said, my wife shops. No, how do you pay $50,000 a month on the credit card? You're only reporting thirty. It's forgiven debt. Kindness of strangers. <laughs> but you have to, I don't care about the facts, I care about the answer to the facts, right? If, if your father is lending you the money to pay the credit cards off, if there's some non-taxable source of money, tell me that. But if I'm looking at a credit report, and the IRS has something called accurate, they look at the same things that we want to look at when we help the taxpayer. You have to have the answer in place. Right, because if somebody reporting 50,000 who's spending 600,000 on a credit card, that's gonna raise suspicion at the Internal Revenue Service. So we have to know it because we're gonna do the bank statement that way. Bank statements are for 12 months, right? If you got money coming in your bank account every month, the IRS is gonna say, well, it's regular, it's coming into your bank account every month, it's income, why isn't it on your tax return? No, that I had a taxpayer who said, and it was 50,000, and he said, that's my allowance. That's what my father gives me every month. You know, I, I, I've never had a job. <laughs> um, you get your wage and income transcripts, your account transcripts, again, you get it from the IRS. The, the, they show lots of things. They show K-1s, partnership income. The, partner, the taxpayers forget, oh yes, I'm a partner in this partnership. They're gonna know that? Or that they have pension accounts, or Whatever shows up, I, gambling winnings. Um, every once in a while, you'll, you'll do these, and you'll get the CTRs, and you'll say, "How is are you cashing so many checks?" Right? They're not supposed to give you the CTRs, John. It says right on it, "Do not give to the taxpayer." If you call practitioner hotline and you say, "Look, I want everything," and they fax them to you, even if and it says right on, "Do not give to that," because I'm not the taxpayer. I'm the taxpayer's rep. But you want to see what the IRS has in their funds. You want to look at the tax returns before you prepare the 433 because you want to protect the taxpayer from themselves. You want to protect them from the incentive to lie because they all believe 
that if they, if they tell the IRS they have less, then it's less likely that the IRS is going to pursue them. Right? They've learned that in business. So what else do you look at? You, when we're, you're valuing comp, everybody says when they're, they're going to the IRS, my house is a dump, it's got no value. And then you look it up on Zillow, oh my God, how pretty it is. Right? The IRS does these drive-bys. I mean, I had, and the revenue officer calls you, right? Have you ever had a revenue officer drive by a taxpayer's house and say, Frank, it's a mansion, you gotta come. <laughs> It's in Franklin Lakes. It's 20,000 square feet. And you tell the tax man, yeah, but it's really run down. I haven't done that. <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> now these are things that you do. I mean, even a simple thing like the Google. So TLO is a, is a service. It's, it's like the, the private practitioner's version of Accurant. So you, uh, it's, if you're on the service, it's like $4 for each report. If you're not, it's more expensive. But it's, it shows you essentially what the IRS is seeing on their Accurant run. And you, wanna, you want to be able to answer as many of the IRS's questions seamlessly. Because when you can, it says, oh, they're not hiding anything. That answers for everything. Right? You want to be in control of the facts. So that means you have to know more about your taxpayer than your taxpayer wants to tell you. Uh, and then sometimes it's a simple Google search, right? We all, I mean, I tell this story a lot of times. I had a case where, again, the taxpayer is crying poverty. I got no money. I can't pay them a dime. Frank, you got to convince them. I got nothing. And then when I walked in, to the IRS office for the CDP conference. They had a big picture of the taxpayer's daughter was getting married in Italy. And in the New York Times announcement that they decided to do the wedding at the family castle. <laughs> <laughs> and they had this beautiful castle and like the bridal party. And they're like, Frank, tell me he's got no money. And I said, you never heard of a rented castle? <laughs> <laughs> but if you're ready, right, you, you can deal with these things, right? But yes, the rented castle. The taxpayer who did my super sweet 16, right? I, we, I had a taxpayer, again, no money, zero cash. I can't pay anything to the IRS. Then the, the revenue officer tells me about a, a television show called My Super Sweet 16, which I, I, saw, I guess it was on MTV, it was pretty popular. And I see my client. <laughs> he's not 16, he's more than 16. But his twins were 16. One of them got a Maserati and the other one got a Porsche. And he came in to the party on an elephant. <laughs> It's for real. I was scared. It's for real. It was a rented elephant. <laughs> the Porsche and the Maserati were rented too. It's not like he, you know. But again, you think about it. He's got the money to spend on this nice party. But he's got no money for the IRS. Or our bills, right? But that happens too. But you want to know this stuff. You, sometimes you're going to say, I'm not going to file for you. This is stupid. Let's wait until this is over. Other times you're going to go in and you're going to go with the story. I went in with the rented castle, right? It was a rented castle. He wanted to make people think he was more successful than he was. So that was the show. Don't believe everything you read in the Times. Fake news, fake news. <laughs> All right, so now before, yes. Was it the yellow search? TLO. TLO is a service uh, from TransUnion. I think, do we have in the materials, like the, the, the website address for, I think we've got a link in the materials to TLO. I highly recommend it. The outline it. is. Yeah, the, high, the outline that's. It's a subscription. It's a subscription service. It's like Accurate. Uh, the outline has links. Every you, you see all the blue underlying in the outline? Those are hyperlinks to bring you to the website so that, for all of this stuff. Okay. Now, what else do you want to read before you fill out a 433? The IRN has the IRS's financial analysis handbook, 
right? What does the handbook do? It tells you how the IRS analyzes the 433. So the, the best way to prepare it is know how the IRS is going to look at it and what questions they're going to ask you based on each line of the return, right? The most, Im the most important thing I can tell you is when you do anything with the IRS, make it look like something they want, right? Make it, put it in a format so that they have to do the least amount of work possible. As we, you saw at the beginning, it went from 13 million cases last year to 14 million cases last year. You know, they changed the policy on offer and compromise on processable versus non-processable. What does non-processable mean? You didn't fill in all the boxes the right way. You didn't stay current. Why are we going to waste time on something that you did wrong, that you didn't pay attention to do it right to begin with? Because we got 14 million cases. Pay attention, do it right. So one of the ways to do it right is learn their rules. Read their rules before you even fill out the form so that you will make their lives easier. Making their lives easier sometimes means that your collection alternative is more likely to be seriously considered. All right? So know what the, the supporting assets and documents look like. Don't say that you have an expense if you haven't verified that the taxpayer has it, right? Because the worst thing that could happen is you put an expense down that this is something I'm paying every month to live. And then you find out that, right? again, you lose credibility. Everything is about keeping the amount of time and suspicion to a minimum. If the, if the IRS trusts the information that you're given, they're more likely to exercise the discretion that they have in favor of your taxpayer, right? So be credible, do the research, don't get caught in a lie. Don't let your taxpayer get caught in a lie, all right? So you want to look at the bank statements, the investment accounts, the credit card statements, life insurance policies, is there cash value, right? Because the IRS is always going to ask you to, to borrow against the tax value. And receipts for the bills that are actually getting paid. And get rid of, tell the taxpayer to get rid of things that are crazy, right? It looks bad for you to be asking for an offer and compromise or a payment agreement when you're driving a Maserati, right? Or a, a you, unless it's going to cost you more money to get out of the lease than be in the lease, get out of the expensive car leases, right? It just makes them mad. Get, uh, if, if you can't get out without a big expense, then you're going to explain it right front, and then we're going to talk about later something called the one-year rule. They give you one year to get rid of excesses and luxuries, and they're not going to. They'll put you on C and C. or give you a reduced payment if you have those things, and you're going to propose it up front. If you see something that's crazy that you know you got to get rid of, right? You're going to exercise on the one-year rule. Say. IRS, it's going to cost me money to get out of this. I don't want to ruin my credit, because if I ruin my credit, I can't pay you. So give me a year to get out of this lease. Get me, give me a year to get out of this apartment, or the length of time that's on the expensive apartment or the lease. That shows that you're sensitive to the issue, but you know that you've got to change. All right. So what are we going to start with? Personal information. You're going to start with your name. All right. How many of your clients have aliases or num multiple social security numbers? Let's get it right, <laughs> all right? Use, I've had, I have too many clients with multiple socials or rent socials. If your guy's really on an ITIN, give me the ITIN. Don't give me the fake socials that you're working under, right? Give me the true taxpayer identification and your real name, not the one you're working under, the real name, okay? And I get it, I know that that makes people afraid and crazy, right? Because you're working under a false social, or you're working under your, a family member's name. But if it's your assessment, let's go with your real name, your real number, where you really work. If you're getting paid cash, then we're gonna, and they've got assessments against you, we're gonna report the cash. We may have you redo the returns on a 4822, but you're definitely not gonna do a return or for financial statement when you're making money and say that I'm making nothing, right? I mean, and 
the, the best is a client said, Frank, what don't you understand about working off the books? Working off the books means it doesn't go on here. <laughs> and you see that part where it says, you signed under penalties of perjury? How are you paying your bills? All right? Even if you're working off the books, it's going on this form. And if you're working off the books, schmuck, you're probably not making enough that you're going to worry about collection alternatives anyway, right? So, I mean, all these people, like, they're making all 30000 off the books. They think they're going to have a big tax liability. You know, you ever do a return? But somebody who makes $30,000 is really going to pay. All right? They, not much. They might get some back. They're going to get some back, right? Most of the, and, you know, that's... The real problem with these cash off the books cases, when you do the computation for guidelines purposes, you know, all these people that they were paid off the books, they get they were really entitled to refunds. I asked the government, you see, you should pay me money. Look at all the money you saved because I paid people off the books. You didn't have to pay that earned income credit out. <laughs> you know, that's never really worked as a defense. <laughs> but and then it, they put it into the bank. You know, look, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, we say, oh, it's horrible. We paid all these people off the books. A lot of these people, you know, what are they screwed with? One, they're not getting Social Security. Two, they should have gotten, you know, the, the credits, right? The child care credit, the, the earned income credit, all these other credits. You know who's really getting screwed when you're getting paid off the books? The guy getting the cash off the books. They, they don't get unemployment, they don't get workers' comp, they, uh, so. But they're undocumented. They get hurt, they're screwed. Yes, yeah, so, so you tell people, even if you're, you think you're off the books, it's no favor. File your returns. Pay the little tax, your Social Security that you're going to pay. You're getting a lot more for it, and most of the cases, you're going to get a refund. So. So how is this form broken out, right? It's going to be your personal information, your employment information, your other financial information, your income and expenses, and the most important section four and five, your assets and your income are going to guide your collection alternatives, right? If you have lots of assets but no income, they're going to ask you to borrow or liquidate an asset. If you have a lot of income and no assets, then you're going to look at the long-term payment agreements, right? Because there's nothing you could sell. You don't have anything to pay a lump sum, but you're going to be looking at long-term payment agreements. So that, that's just your overall rules. So your personal information, right? Look at who owes the tax, right? If it's a joint return, then you probably have a joint liability. But if you're going to claim innocent spouse, you may not want to file joint 433s. One may want to file their innocent spouse, Filing the innocent spouse claim on the 8857 does what? Stays the IRS's ability to collect against the requesting spouse. So they can still collect against the non-requesting spouse. So you're going to want to file your 433 for the non-requesting spouse, even though you're prosecuting your innocent spouse claim for the requesting spouse. Okay? TFRP is another example of when you're not going to do a joint 433, because in most cases, only one of the two spouses is on the hook for the TFRP. Uh, and the same thing happens in these injured spouse cases, right, where someone remarries, second marriage, where they bring um, a tax into the marriage, right? So those are the three you're going to be sensitive of. Are you filing a joint 433 or are you filing an individual 433? Um, you know, the IRS, don't use the post office box. The IRS is going to figure out where they live. Plan on the drive-by. You know, they're going to do the drive-by. Yeah, don't mow the lawn. <laughs> on the 2848, though, what, what phone number are you going to put? Your phone number. 6304. There is a code section that says once you file, a 2848 in a collection case, who does the IRS have to deal with? The rep. The rep. Even though they like to deal with the taxpayer directly, in collection cases, there's an internal revenue code section that says they must deal with the rep. The Taxpayer Bill of Rights now says that taxpayers have the right to representation. So if you file a power of attorney and you are responsive, the IRS must deal with you, even though it believes it's, it's easier, it's faster, it's more direct to go to the taxpayer. Other issue, once you have a 2848, 
can they tell you to bring the taxpayer? No. no. Not without a summons, right? And if they go to the step of bringing and asking you to bring the taxpayer, even though you're representing and you're cooperating, your spidey sense should go off. And what's the answer to every question? The fifth. The fifth. That's right. Right? Because it is unusual for them to ask you to bring the taxpayer. And if they're asking you to bring the taxpayer, something should go off in your head. Why aren't they willing to take the information on a 433 prepared by a professional you know, that you have verified and studied all the collection alternatives? Why do they want to talk to the guy who doesn't have you know, the same education credentials that you do? Right? So that should automatically make you think. So the phone number is your phone number. You're attaching your 2848. You're making it clear. Remember that I said you're sending them a letter in the beginning? You're setting out some ground rules. Here's the 2848. You're going to deal with me. You're not going to file a lien unless you give me my cap rights. So there's a whole bunch of things you're going to do up front to establish in a collection case the taxpayer's right number six, which is the right to representation. All right? Uh, and that's what the statute says. The statute says very clearly, without prior consent of the taxpayer given directly or express permission of a court of competent jurisdiction, the secretary may not communicate with the taxpayer in connection of, of any collected tax, right, if the power of attorney is in place. They, and can they call you at work? Can they call the taxpayer at work? No. No, because your letter says don't call the taxpayer at work. They don't. You have a right to, both in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights now and in the statute, there is a right to privacy, there is a right to confidentiality. Your problems with the IRS, the taxpayer problem with the IRS are private, right? There's a code section that says then if you are cooperating, they're not even allowed to talk to third parties because there's confidentiality. People who know that the IRS is not going to go to third parties, are more likely to give truthful information to the IRS. If, on the other hand, they think that the IRS is going to be a washwoman and tell everybody about their business and their trouble, they're less likely to voluntarily comply. So the code provides all of this secrecy. It provides secrecy on the IRS people, right? They're not supposed to blab. They're supposed to keep it secret. It puts it on the collection division. Respect your privacy. Respect your confidentiality. Assume that taxpayers with a tax debt want to do the right thing until they've done something wrong, right? But that, and that's, Congress has found that to be very important because it's important to creating a system where we have voluntarily compliant, self-assessing taxpayers, all right? The other thing the code says, they're not allowed to harass you the same way collection agents do, right? You owe money to the government, but it's still the government, all right? They, you work for the government, there's a level of respect and decorum in everything you do. Yes, John? Are these collection agencies that they're uh, supposedly contracting out, contracting out with under the same provisions? Yes, the and they can be sued, and there's private causes of action, and the, the in New Jersey, they're using Pioneer, right? So Pioneer has a long length of experience with New Jersey now. They've gone through it. I have found them to be very good. The other thing that you will find when, you're, when you start dealing with the private collection agencies is they record every telephone call, all right? So, and that's gonna go, goes both ways because as we've learned from dealing with Pioneer, taxpayers say, oh, the guy harassed me. And you, you have the right to bring that to the decision maker in New Jersey, right? to listen to it and say, did the collector go overboard? And the overwhelming majority of the telephone calls, it's the taxpayer who loses their temper, not the collector. And a collector, the New Jersey says it all the time, if they listen to a telephone call and they think that the collector has been rude or overzealous, what are they gonna tell Pioneer to do? Ax them. And that's something the government can't do, right? Can you fire a revenue officer who goes a little bit over the line? Can you fire a private employee who goes over the line who's going to jeopardize a lucrative contract with the state of New Jersey or to the Internal Revenue Service? I mean, they, they, have, they know that this is important. They've read the New York Times articles. They've seen all this. Everybody's hoping for these private collectors to fail. 
right? It's, it's all over, right? But they're cognizant of that. They're not going to make the mistakes of the past. Pioneer has been in this business for a long time now. They're not going to jeopardize it by letting people go and be overzealous because how much are they getting under this new collection contract? Do anybody know the percentage? No, the Pioneer gets 10.7% from the state of New Jersey because New Jersey, Tom McDonald, you know, the guys who, who he was here, he, he negotiates the contract, he was cheap. The IRS, they're more generous. How much are they getting? 25 percent. All right. In New Jersey, how many cases are in the queue that are over a million bucks that the IRS hasn't had an opportunity to work? There's over a thousand cases in the queue above a million bucks that the that what's the you know cases that the IRS doesn't have people to work on. So this could potentially be a very lucrative contract for the private collectors. You think they're going to jeopardize it? Yes. No, they have. They they only have the power to do one thing: enter into installment agreements. Right? One. They're only getting cases that the IRS has had for more than three years, so they're not getting anything new. And they're only looking at cases where the IRS hasn't touched the file in at least one year. So they're getting the older cases. And they're only authorized to enter into installment agreements and, and payment agreements. They're not allowed to, you know, not, they, they have less authority than they even have with New Jersey. They're not even allowed to, like in New Jersey, they can abate a penalty in order to get an interest, uh, to get an installment agreement, right? They have some give and take. Uh, they have very little power. And there's also something in the law that, uh, well, it's not in the law, it's in the regs, that if you don't like the collector, the federal collector, you have the ability to send a letter saying, I don't like them, I want you to send the case back to the Internal Revenue Service, and they will. All right, so they, you don't have to deal with them if you don't want to deal with them. So it, it, it's, it's a very different world. Um, but the, the harassment thing is, the IRS person cannot harass, oppress, or abuse any person with the collection of the tax, right? You can't threaten them with violence or other criminal means. Uh, you can't swear at them, yell at them, call them a deadbeat. Um, you can't keep calling them on the phone and keep bothering them, right, uh, in terms of harassment. And um, so they're subject to all the rules under the Fair Debt Collection Act. And what, ha what rights do you have if they do these things? Right, there, there's private causes of action and punishments. Private causes of action, 7433, lets you sue the government. It says, look, you're, you were negligent. You were negligent in your supervision of these people. You were negligent in what they did. They caused me harm. You need to now reimburse me. Even though I owed you money, you were negligent in the way you collected the money and tried to collect the money, and I'm suing you, IRS. Those suits are taken very seriously. And two, there's, there's something called 1203, right? 1203B, it's called the 10 deadly sins. It's ticked, right? And uh, the, uh, the 12 deadly sins are 12 things, well, or actually 10 things, that an IRS person can do that go so far over the line that the IRS has to consider terminating them. All right. And the 12 sins include harassment. Uh, and how do they define harassment? Being overly aggressive, overly zealous, being rude to the taxpayer, not respecting the taxpayer's rights, the taxpayer's privacy, right? Because this, after all, is the federal government, right? The IRS people, they're supposed to be and behave as the best of the best. They represent all of us in every interaction with the American taxpayer. I mean, aspirationally, that's the goal, right? So if there is this bad apple, there's a form to file about the bad apples at the Internal Revenue Service. And maybe the first time, and the first time there's a complaint against somebody, you know, that's not going to happen, right? Because they're going to believe the, the, 
the service employee before they believe us because, you know, we owe money. On the other hand, if they get more than a couple of complaints about somebody, then you understand where there's smoke, there's fire. Two, they also know if you are a credible representative and you try to work within the system and then you're the one that files the complaint, they're going to say, wait, this is a problem because we know this firm. This firm works with us. This firm always does the right thing. They're filing a complaint and they're going to the trouble of filing a complaint. That's serious. I actually had a manager once, right? I, I gave him a call. The, 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 the revenue officer had gone over the line and he was going over the line with one of my young tax professionals that something that he or she wouldn't have done if it was me, right? Threatened the tax for the guy. Look, if you don't get this 433A in by Friday, you know, I'm going to send this case for criminal prosecution, right? Just because uh, he just he needed to get it off his desk. It was a, a young lawyer, and you know sometimes they stay that right, and it, it, it's not right. Expression. It's just not right. The CID would hate if they heard things like that. They don't take referrals because somebody got a four thirty three in late. I mean, I can see a group badger at CID. Well, that's the fraud referral. <laughs> so, but it, it, it terrorized the young attorney and. And you know you, you got to report that back to the taxpayer. So I called the group manager. Said, "Look, you got somebody you got to get under control. Right? This is wrong." I find out that the group manager filed to take the complaint against his own employee. <laughs> he said, "I said I don't want to do. You know, I don't want to hurt the kid." He said, "Frank, this is, this guy's working for me. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I got to do something." He filed to take the complaint. So that's how seriously the IRS takes this. They, it, the, there are rules, and I, that, it's a different seminar we cover. But you know, they're supposed to, there's a rule. The IRS people are supposed to call you back within 48 hours, and there are you, there's levels of penalties for people who don't return phone calls. A first offense, a second offense, a third offense. There's a whole bunch of things, swearing, and the, the, the union negotiates with the Internal Revenue Service certain penalties for the IRS employees who do things that are outside you know, the, the scope of employment that make the Internal Revenue Service look badly. You know, if you take a bribe, that's termination. That, you know, that, you're not, they're not allowed to ask you for money, other than to pay the Internal Revenue Service, right? They can't bring you the, uh, they, they're not supposed to come to the restaurant and eat and not pay for their lunch. They're not supposed to drop their car off while they're getting collection, save money, do a wash and wax. Um, <laughs> you know, th those are things that are bad. Um, so th everything that they do, they're supposed to do as representatives of the United States government. They shouldn't do anything that they'd be embarrassed to see on videotape. So marital status, people like to lie about this. If you're married, you're married. If you're not, you're not. Uh, you know, just because if you really are married, you gotta put it down. You can't say, oh, but I don't want my wife involved. I don't want her to know. I don't want her to get all these notices. Lying about your marital status is still a lie. All right. Uh, dependence, dependence <laughs> really should match the return um, most of the time, right? You, every once in a while, I have a taxpayer who says, Frank, Frank, I got three illegitimates. I help support them too. Uh, but, you know, that, I should get credit for that. <laughs> Wait, did you tell your wife? <laughs> well, yes? I have a question. So, um, Right, who has three children, none of them live with them, but yes. like 40% of the time, and pays child support. I put it down. Child support yeah. is a court-ordered payment. Yeah, right? put the child support down, but can I also put the dependents down? Well, you got to put the dependents down on the front. The it, yes, I, I, I would put it down, because to the extent that there is a child support order and you are supporting the child, then that's a bona fide thing to do, right? The, they're gonna ask you for checks to make sure that you're actually paying, all right? That, because that's the other part of it, right? People will bring you the order and says, I'm supposed to pay, when's the last time you paid? Five years ago. <laughs> right, you can't take a payment that you're not making. 
even like home mortgage, right? How many people are not paying their home mortgages? They're, wait, their home mortgages, they're waiting for HARP, but they want to take the full home mortgage. Now, the, the 433 is a cash basis form. Right? There's good things about it being a cash basis form, like when you get K-1s with phantom income, you back out the phantom income, but there's bad things about it being a cash basis form. So it is a real cash basis form. All right. uh, they're going to ask you for the employer's name, address, W-4s. Watch your W-4s. Yeah, you always want to get the W-4 to just zero out the tax. Not to pay more, not to pay less. Why? If you have a refund, what happens? They take it. It's an offset. Right? So what you want is to, measure, to just pay your current tax. That may leave you with more or less money, right? Having too few means you're going to owe money at the end of the year. You're going to, you're not going to be able to stay current. Having too much gives you a refund that's not included within your collection alternatives because you get no credit for your refunds unless your collection alternative is full payment of tax. So part of what we're doing when you're doing the 433 is make sure that you've adjusted the W-4 so that your withholdings are closer to spot on. I'd rather owe 100 bucks than get a $100 refund, right? But you want to get as close as possible with your withholding allowances. <coughs> uh, again, taxpayer's rep, we, we talked about that. Spouse's employer, if the spouse doesn't know, you don't give the employer, right? You don't want the risk. Even though the IRS isn't supposed to contact them, you don't want the risk of them having information that they would inappropriately use. Liable party, 2848, make it very clear. Don't have, don't confuse them. If somebody doesn't owe money, don't, and they'll ask you, I need a joint retention, joint return, I need the 2848 for everything. No, because if you put the, it on the 2848 and somebody key punches it wrong, then you're gonna start getting notices that have both names on it. Be careful. The 2848 is only the spouse that owes the money, right? Don't create the situation where the computer can make a mistake without somebody thinking about it. All right. Financial information, right? Do all your searches, right? Are you a party to a lawsuit? Nobody ever wants to report the lawsuits where they're the plaintiff because they think that my ship is going to come in. I need this offer and compromise done before the, the money hits because I don't want to give this to the Internal Revenue Service, right? You gotta list all the lawsuits, right? Whether they count it or not is up to them. Like in a lot of cases, it's a lawsuit. You don't know if you're gonna hit or not. They're gonna evaluate it, but not putting it down, and the money then comes in, then you're offering compromise where it's procured by fraud. All right, or they're gonna find it because they have accurate and they see these searches. Or the lawsuits can now be found, some lawsuits are on Google. If you're in federal court, it doesn't take all that much to find a lawsuit that ends up being the first lie that people are caught with. So don't try to hide the lawsuits. Have you filed for bankruptcy? That's a good thing. People forget about bankruptcies. They don't put bankruptcies down. Sometimes the bankruptcy would have discharged this tax liability to begin with. Other times, the bankruptcy confirms to the Internal Revenue Service that things were really bad, right? Most people don't file for bankruptcy or lose their homes if things are great. If you're saying, hey, it's unlikely I'm going to be able to pay, then listing these prior bankruptcies is important. The, the, what people get afraid of is these assets on the bankruptcy petition they got to keep, right? The IRS lien is on what's called the Schedule B assets, and they have to be counted when you do the AET, the Asset Equity Table. But that's just the way it is. The bankruptcies can be found on PACER, can be found on Westlaw. The IRS can find the bankruptcies. So don't forget the bankruptcies and the assets. Uh, have you gone outside the IRS, lived outside the IRS? Being outside the IRS extends the statute of limitations. Living outside the IRS, then you've got to say, hey, I have foreign bank accounts, that I acquire any assets, etc. There's a lot that comes with this now because the IRS has gone global, right? We have FATCA, we have all of these issues. Don't hide.
that you've been outside the IRA, the United States. They can also, there's a computer now where they, they share information with the passport office. Trusts, insurance policies, inheritances. There are people who are beneficiaries of trusts. Right? If the trust is set up right, the IRS can't grab the money. But if that money is available to you, you know, they're going to say, why should we give you an offer and compromise? Right? If you're the beneficiary of trust and you're getting money in, the mere fact that the IRS can't get to the trust doesn't mean you don't tell them about it. All right? Yes? Frank, how do you treat an estate that is A, not yet enumerated, and B, not yet paid out? Well, that's, that's the other thing, right? There are lots of people who say, I don't want to take my distribution until... I've settled my tax claim, right? Now, that's a problem for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one, has the executor aided and abetted the evasion of tax payments, right? To the extent that there are the notices of federal tax lien, it's a public record that the beneficiary owes money. Paying the beneficiary directly may be a problem for the executor of the estate. Um, two, the question asks, are you the beneficiary? It doesn't say, has the estate paid out yet? It says, are you the beneficiary? Is money coming? Right? If you owe taxes, do you think that it is appropriate for you to say to people that owe you money, hey, estate, don't give me my money. Give it to my sister. She'll hold it for me. Or to, do, to be able, can you disclaim an inheritance because I don't want that money going to pay my just tax debt? Sure. Yep. <laughs> no. Uh, I okay. guess not. <laughs> Sorry, I have to answer the question. But come on. God. <laughs> All right. What we got? The king's debt or dying. The king shall first be paid. Right? What comes before taxes? Not then. Right. Are you the trustee, fiduciary? Can, uh, basically, these these entities, whether they be trusts, foreign corporations, estates, that hold money for people are the same as if it is your money. If you have the right to demand it, then it's your money. The IRS lien and the IRS claim attaches to all property and <coughs> rights to property of a taxpayer. And the IRS stands in the shoes of the taxpayer. So if the taxpayer could get to the money, then the IRS has a lien on the money. So again, if you don't want to tell the IRS about this, then don't be requesting a collection alternative. Remember, collection alternatives are what you propose to the Internal Revenue Service, right? They have all these powers under the code. They have the power to lean. They have the power to levy, right? You're going to the IRS and saying, please don't exercise those powers that you have. Work with me. Let me have my collection alternative. That collection alternative is based on an honest effort to comply with your obligations of the law, but that balances the government's need for the taxes with your concerns about being able to live. Lying is never an appropriate thing to do. If you gotta lie, don't even do it. You, you, you're better off letting the IRS try to find the asset on its own and levy and seize than you lying to the IRS, right? The cover-up is always worse than the original crime. The false 433 is always worse than doing nothing, right? Because that proves the guilty mind, the bad purpose, the evil intent that will take a civil collection case and transform it into either a criminal case or transfer liability case. Sometimes the, the hardest thing to do is just say there's a 10-year statute of limitations. I'm not going to do anything or say anything for 10 years. So the, the IRS, the IRM, makes very clearly that if you have an interest in the estate, they want that money. 
They want you to try, if the estate is illiquid, they want you to borrow, ask the executor for a loan against your inheritance, right? Well, they, they can say no, but you gotta ask. Same thing, the IRM uh, wants you to look, if you're the beneficiary of a policy, if it's if you've got cash value, they wanna see, can you take the cash value? If you have the right to take the cash value of the policy, why shouldn't it go to the IRS to pay taxes? Unless you file, you know, when we talk about office and compromise, uh, effective tax administration, there are things to do. Yes? Can you just go back to the previous screen? So in that quotation, what, what the letter that they missed the scene there, or? Whole life policies should be reviewed as an asset for borrowing against or liquidating them. Period. Whole life policies are generally well, deemed to be an investment. About the first. Oh. Uh, Consider interest in estates and trusts from which money may be borrowed to make payments. Right, if you have an interest in an estate or you have an interest in a trust, the IRS is gonna say, hey, taxpayer, you're gonna get that money. Why don't you do with that money the thing you should do with that money? Pay your just debt to the government. Of course they're gonna ask that. Doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be able to do it, right? If it's a spendthrift trust, the IRS may not be able to grab the money. But they have the right to ask you to try to get to the money, right? That is their job. Their job is to collect the correct tax. They need to balance the effect of the tax against the hardship that it results in. But the other side of it is, there's you know, that uh, $138 billion owed. How much did Americans voluntarily pay last year? Three and a half trillion. Three and a half trillion dollars. That's exactly right. So, if you are one of the people who paid the three and a half trillion dollars owed, are you okay with the guy who's got money in a trust paying nothing? No. So that's why, I mean, it may seem harsh, but they're doing their job, right? That's what they're supposed to do. All right, Jeff says, uh, what, should I take another break? Is it time for another break, or do you just want me to work through it? Because I can, there's a lot to do. You, you guys okay without a break, or? Okay. We leave a quarter. No, you're not getting the extra time. I'm taking it for myself. This is teaching. You're supposed to leave learning. <laughs> I'm going to make you better collectors, right? We're going to the, next year that 14 million. I want it to be 13 million 900 thousand. I want you to in a year. I need you to take 100 thousand cases out of inventory. Then we'll all be rich, right? We want it to come back. If we could all, if the people in this room settle 100 thousand cases in a year, that's a goal. Uh, how's the IRS find out about the? Uh, trusts and estates, they send K-1s. Insurance policies send 712s. 1099s tell them about interest income. Uh, they do chancery court searches that tell you about probate information and wills that have been uh, submitted for uh, filing. So the, the collector gets a lot of information. So you won't be able to hide this information anyway. So just know what you're gonna do with it. Right. Safe deposit boxes, again, you know, lots of people, you got cash in the safe deposit box, you think it's okay not to tell the IRS about it? Have you transferred assets for less than the value? And they ask for 10 years. Usually it's my clients, it's 10 minutes. Um, you can't just say, hey, I owe these taxes. I don't want to pay them. I'm going to transfer my assets to my children. That's my estate plan. Does that work? Right, the answer to every fraudulent conveyance is, it was estate planning. I was looking to save taxes. Right. Estate planning is looking to save death taxes. Right? The, the taxes on your estate are the excess of transfers of, of assets on death. And what's the first thing in most wills that you're supposed to do on death? Pay your taxes. That includes income taxes estate taxes, all taxes. You don't get to transfer assets to your kids tax-free, right? Unless you hire very expensive lawyers and we plan your whole life 
not to pay taxes legitimately, and then we get rid of the estate tax, so you don't have to pay. But other than that, right, unless you're working with a family office, which is, you know, part of my job, uh, you don't get to just say, hey, I'm gonna transfer the assets to my kids, and I'm not gonna pay taxes. I'm gonna transfer the assets to my kids, and I'm gonna have the government pay for my nursing home with Medicaid, right? There's rules, right? Uh, you can't just say, hey, I want to go into a nursing home tomorrow, I'm transferring my house to my kids, right? That's called Medicaid planning. There's a five-year gap, right? Five-year look back. There's a five-year look back, right? The IRS, what's the statute of limitations for the IRS for the collection of tax? Ten. Ten. So what's the IRS look back? Ten. Ten. Right? So that's why they ask you, have you transferred your assets? Because you can't transfer your assets away once you have a tax liability, or once you know you're going to have a tax liability, and say to the rest of the United States, you're going to subsidize my tax liability. Right? It doesn't work that way. They also ask you, what happens is if I put my business in my daughter's name, right? so that she earns everything, so then I can just do my own from conference, guys, or I earn nothing, I just live on what my daughter gives me. Right. If your daughter lives in California and the business is here in New Jersey, that's probably not going to work. Right? If, uh, there, there's lots of cases where people put businesses in other people's names, brothers, uh, family members, children. That's called transferee liability, alter ego liability, nominee liability. If you control the income that is generated by the asset, the business, the real estate, the trust, then the IRS is going to deem you to be the beneficial owner of the asset, even if you don't have legal title to the asset, and they're going to ask that that asset be included and considered in either your asset equity table or your income and expense table. So that's why they ask you about nominees, transferees, alter egos. And so you want to do the searches and you want to explain what's happened, if the assets have transferred, and how do, you, how do they see that assets have transferred? The asset was on the tax return one year, and then it disappeared from another, right? When, they, when you do the, the due diligence, you're looking at the back tax returns, and all of a sudden you have a Schedule B that was thrown off lots of interest income, and then all of a sudden you see nothing on there, where'd it go? Or there were assets or real estate on a Schedule E, or there's home mortgage interest deductions, or there was K-1s. When stuff disappears from a return, right before you're gonna be submitting a financial statement to the government, you need to ask yourself what happened. Because they're not idiots. They're gonna see the same things that you're seeing. You need to be able to answer those questions. So when you're doing the 433, you should be thinking about that stuff. All right, now we go to assets, right? Certain assets the government can't take, right? That there is a statute, 6334, and it's a little broader than you think, okay? One, the IRS can't take your clothes. All right, see? Shucks. <laughs> All right, wearing apparel, uh, things that are necessary. And, and they put into wearing apparel school books, right? Wearing apparel and school books. So they can't take your kids' school books. Like, they have anybody have books anymore? I would assume that that means your iPad is safe. Um, fuel, they can't come and take the gas from your tank. <laughs> Look, somebody thought about this, right? Uh, that they were worried about the government taking your fuel. You need to be heated, there's oil in your tank. It was expensive once. They thought they'd siphon it out. No, the government can't do that. Uh, your furniture and your personal effects, right? They, they can't take your livestock and your poultry. So there's... Buy a bunch of chickens. My chickens are safe. Yeah, they're safe. So $6,250 in personal property is safe. So that's your that's the value of your personal property assets is sixty two hundred and fifty dollars, right? They can't take your books and tools of trade of your business and profession, right? So and very and the, there is a limit on that of thirty one hundred bucks. But what we will always argue 
in these cases is if you take away the, the, what they need to generate income, they're not going to be able to generate income for the IDT side of the table. So you can't double count. And the IRS has actually recognizes that, right? If you have the asset, but that asset is necessary to generate income, it doesn't, it's not a double counted asset. You don't account it on the AET and then you don't account it again on the IET. Unemployment benefits, right? How sad is that? You can't levy on unemployment. I don't know how often I gotta tell people at the IRS that, right? You can't levy on unemployment. You shouldn't be considering it as part of the monthly income. Um, public assistance, you know, supplemental security for the aged, blind, and disabled. Now the IRS now has policy. They, the IRS is okay with, they're not taking disability income anymore. All right? See, kind and gentle. Don't you, everybody thinks they're hard-hearted. No, if you're, if you're disabled, if you are on public assistance or public welfare, the IRS is not going to be grabbing that. From your wheelchair? <laughs> Depends on how nice the wheelchair is. <laughs> <laughs> Maserati. It's a Maserati. <laughs> right? that I, there, if you look up, there is a case that I was involved in. It was in People's Magazine where they wanted to take the wheelchair. <laughs> It was made of gold. It, they were, at the end of the day, they were very sorry that they tried to take a 10-year-old girl's wheelchair. They couldn't get the guy out. It was a mistake. You know, not everybody that works for the IRS is perfect, right? We're not perfect, our clients aren't perfect, and it would be unreasonable to expect that everybody that worked for the IRS is perfect. <laughs> but every once in a while, they will even shock my conscience, like trying to take a girl's wheelchair. <laughs> that was just to show the father. He spent that money, he should have called the revenue officer first before he spent that money on that chair. He's not gonna get to keep it. Uh, they're not supposed to take the taxpayer's personal residence unless they go through lots of hoops. Right? Um, they are not right principal residence, right? Because making people homeless, making a family homeless, is something that the government should really think about before they do it. Um, and that's it. One of the other things that's not on here, but child support. Right? Child support is a tough thing to, for the IRS. The court awards child support, not for the benefit of the receiving spouse, but for the benefit of the children of that spouse. Right? Even if the, the receiving spouse owes money, it's thought of as inappropriate for the IRS to take the children's money to satisfy the parent's liability. So in those cases, you're going to start thinking about not commingling child support with other money in a bank account. Include cash that is uh, cash on hand. If you keep the cash in the mattress, it goes on the 433. <laughs> Everybody wants to use just the bank balances. Now, you know, and you think, I'm not going to say, but yes, there are clients who have lots of money. They don't trust banks. They keep lots of cash. The IRS finds PayPal accounts, all bank accounts, everything that's electronic. Your Bitcoin, that goes on these statements now too, right? Anything that's cash or a cash equivalent, they're going to find. Uh, now, can you do a 433 for somebody who doesn't have a bank account? Yes. Absolutely. Right? There is no requirement that you have a bank account. All right? So all you have to do when you, you don't have a bank account, you have to figure out a legal way to pay your bills. All right? Putting money in other people's names in order to pay your bills because you're afraid of the IRS grabbing your bank account is actually found. And I, I've cited a case where they prosecuted taxpayers for putting money in other people's names in order to pay their bills, right? Because the only reason you're doing that is to evade the payment of tax. So you have a taxpayer, he owes money, 
You create a corporation with a different EIN in order to avoid the levies, right? That's a crime, right? Warehouse banking. Warehouse banking. That's that is what it's called warehouse banking. It's just, uh, and why, think of it. Why are you doing a corporation that's only activity is to hold your money to pay your bills if it's got no other business? You're doing it because you don't want to pay your tax, right? You don't, not that you don't want to pay your tax. You don't want the IRS to grab the money. And so you're defeating the ability for them to collect a just debt, right? That's, a, it's called, the crime is called evasion of payment. And many people didn't think that that was a crime. There were lots of accountants who were counseling people to do that. And, yeah, they got indicted. <laughs> so, you got to, so you can have a bank account for somebody who, but what you got to figure out is, all right, they're going to the check casher, they're cashing their checks, they're buying their money orders, they're paying their bills, you're gonna keep copies, you're not gonna violate the law, right? There is no requirement that you have a bank account. There's no legal obligation to have a bank account. Lots of poor people can't open bank accounts, right? But at the same time, you gotta be careful not to violate the law or lie when you're explaining to the IRS why your client doesn't have a bank account. Yes? I guess on that, the uh, bank account on somebody else's name, this would not be a felony, you know, illegal, like undocumented people that cannot open an account and then they cause them or whatever. They have a reason. Yeah, that's not, a bad reason. Not to avoid the act of, they would not. Oh, to avoid the immigration laws. That's no, a better no, no. reason. Some of them cannot open my account because, because they need to show So they want to fraudulently use the banking system to do something. How about the know your clients? They're hiding their identity. No, no, no. What I'm saying is they are not hiding. They are paying their tax. Yeah. Uh, they just did it because they, they couldn't open an account. This is what you have to do. Is this a confession? No, this is what you have to understand. <laughs> Any time you have to lie to somebody, in order to get the benefit, there is absolutely a crime that's being committed. Sometimes it's gonna be bank fraud, sometimes it's gonna be wire fraud. The, the reasons you have to do it, the reason they have to do it is because they're here in the country illegally. Okay, so that's a felony too. Even if that's a felony too. Even if they're their taxes. <laughs> it's called money laundering. <laughs> yes, oh shit. <laughs> That is the technical <laughs> term when you find out that your client was trying to avoid committing one felony and they committed another one. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, 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 <laughs> yes, but fact, that's what all these bank agreements are. You know, everybody who's got an overseas account slowly is getting requests from the bank saying, you know, give me a W-9, give me your United States bank account, right? Why are the, the banks have become arms of the Internal Revenue Service. Why have they become arms of the Internal Revenue Service? Because if they don't provide the information and have a protocol to identify the United States clients, their investments, the IRS is going to withhold 30% on their investments. All these banks, all these foreign financial institutions, the FFIs, want to invest in the United States, um, whether in the stock market, whether in currency reserves, uh, and they don't want withholding or seizures of that money. So they are implementing FATCA, and, or throughout Europe it's called CRS, Common Reporting Standards, where the governments are now sharing information. That sharing of information is resulting in many of the audits that the Internal Revenue Service is doing. Um, I can tell you, most of my work right now is on audits that were triggered by information that was given to the Internal Revenue Service from a foreign bank or a foreign government under a treaty. And the taxpayers who hadn't come in under the Voluntary Disclosure Program, the IRS is now looking after and they are prosecuting both civilly and criminally with a vengeance you have never seen before. Um, so they, they are finding out. There's gonna be no place on the globe where you can do an electronic financial transaction and be safe 
and you make sure that you know, the people that you give the money aren't going to steal your money, that the United States isn't going to know about. So, you know, whether you think that's a good thing or it's a bad thing, it's a fact. So, well, they call it facta. Facta, facta. <laughs> So that, again, if the government wants you to list all your stocks and your bonds and everything that's on there, they're going to know, right? The electronic transactions, uh, interest dividends, any re reputable financial house is going to be issuing information reports that let the IRS know. So that's why I say get the W&Is, even stuff that the taxpayer forgets about, like a million dollar bank account, you know, it would generate interest. Pension um, funds, right? You pension said that, funds. right? Pension yeah, funds. The, the 5498s are going to get done, right? There, there are going to be things. More and more information reporting is is happening every day, and the IRS computer is getting the the people at the IRS are actually behind on understanding and knowing the information that they're getting. The, the IRS has a computer or has access. Revenue officers have access to what's called text. The Treasury Inspect the, the Treasury Enforcement Communication System, Tex, right? The information going into Tex is now available to civil revenue officers. What's going into Tex? Passport information. Every time you know that, that somebody comes in and out of the United States, that goes into Tex. Your driver's license information, where you're getting tickets, that's going into Tex. The information that getting under FACA is going into Tex. All the 50. 5472s where foreigners saying they have investments in the United States companies going into tax, right? When they figure out how to put all of this information together, right, the IRS is going to be able to track every dollar above $10,000 where it's gone all over the world and how it ports back to your taxpayer, your taxpayer's address, and your taxpayer's social security number. So, I mean, and that is the future, right? The whole, what FACTA is designed to do is to make the global banking system comply with the same information reporting as the United States banking system so that the governments are going to get 1099s and that those 1099s are going to alert the taxing authorities to look at tax returns and make sure that those accounts are reported so that foreign accounts and domestic accounts are going to be on an equal keel, right? And that's, aspirationally, that's their goal. And those of you who deal with Europe are seeing with CRS, the goal isn't now just to share information with the United States. The goal is for all of the European countries to share information with each other. Because, as we all know, in Europe, tax evasion is the national sport, right behind <laughs> soccer. <laughs> They all would move money to the other countries, right? If you lived in Italy, you had your money in Switzerland. If you had your money in, in Great Britain, you, you moved your money to France. I mean, all the other countries, right, have exercised something called the revenue rule. The revenue rule is one of the first principles of international law, that one sovereign will not assist another sovereign in collecting tax debt, right? The IRS slammed down that rule of international law with FACTA, and now it's that it, the, the other countries are falling like dominoes. And that's why you see something like the Panama Papers, or the International Consortium. So the reporters are getting on it, right? And saying, who's got these secret foreign accounts? Do you believe that, you know, one of the accounts said that, that Putin has $200 billion in foreign bank accounts on the globe. How does somebody who makes $100,000 a year have $200 billion in foreign bank accounts? Uh, <laughs> smart investing. <laughs> he bought, you know, Google early. <laughs> All right. Uh, so W and I is going to find your retirement accounts. Uh, look at the equity. Um, look at the, the tax. The IRS is going to value your IRA accounts or your pension assets at 70% because they realize that you're going to have to pay tax when you take it out. Um, okay, that's gonna be lines of credit. The IRS is going to ask you to borrow. They can't tell you to borrow because there's a problem with um, if they look at your 433 and it looks like you have no additional money 
left at the end of a month to pay the IRS? What is it when the IRS insists that you go to a bank and borrow money that you're not going to be able to repay the bank? That's called conspiracy to commit bank fraud. The first time a bank went after a IRS revenue officer for conspiracy to commit bank fraud, it was all over the national office. On, do our people really tell them to take out loans that they can't pay back? So now it's, they don't. The official rule is that the IRS will not tell you to take out a loan or to put money on a credit card that they know from looking at your 433 that you have no ability to pay back. They're only going to ask that you consider, see, consider lines of credit which may be borrowed upon. You know, the, the, this, uh, again, the, this was a big issue recently with the, the, the script on the, the collectors, right? Did anybody see the New York Times article? The, the collectors, the, the third party collectors that the IRS hired, took information directly from the IRS's website and put it into a script to read to taxpayers where they said, consider borrowing money, right? And like the papers were all over it. Now they're telling them to commit bank fraud. <laughs> no, they're, they're asking you to consider ways to pay your legally just obligations. They are not encouraging you to rob Peter to pay Paul. Okay. All right, I can say what. No, but and that's how you push back, right? That that's how you push back. You're not asking to commit bank fraud, are you? <laughs> uh, it's important, right? And that and that's that's the practice pointer here. Where you write, you show them the credit report, you show them the 433, you you make it clear that if they borrow, they they need to pay it back. That it would be a crime to do what they're suggesting that you do. Again, life insurance is on the air. I mean, now, some agents are going to tell you cancel your life insurance. Right? You don't have to cancel your life insurance, right? Because you have young kids, you got to take care of them. That's generally going to be considered a necessary life insurance. What they're going to say is cancel your whole life policy because whole life is seen to be an investment account. They're going to say get term, right? Take care of term to take care of your family. Uh, cash value only, decrease, borrow down on loan, borrow down on the whole life if to pay the IRS if you can't cancel it, if you're too sick, you have a pre-existing condition, you don't want to cancel the policy, then you work with the IRS. So you know, they can't ask you to cancel a policy if there is no way for you to get another one to take care of your family. Uh, equity in real estate, again, every once in a while, you're going to look at equity in real estate. They're going to push back on equity in real estate. But there are offers called effective tax administration offers. There are deferred payments. There are things where you have to push back and say, look, if, do you want somebody to have to move out of the house? And you know, where are they going to go? What is it going to cost them to go into the substitute piece of property? IRS, you have a federal tax lien on this property. If they sell it, you're going to get the money. If they die, you're going to get the money. So why do you want to put an older person out on the street? You know, because if the husband or someone owed money, right? A lot of these cases involve widows, right? Where the husband died owing money, that they, they used the money to pay medical bills. I mean, there, so even with equity, you, you have to be able to be creative, but don't lie and don't, you know, about getting the equity. You're not gonna get sympathy if you've had to lie. Report the equity and then explain the taxpayer's challenge. Uh, the, how's the IRS going to find the real estate? If you're paying the mortgage and you're getting the mortgage interest, even if the house is in somebody else's name, right? How many people put the house in somebody else, in, in the kid's name, but they have to pay the mortgage because the kid can't get the mortgage without them? They're going to see that because you're pay, getting the 1098. Um, so again, there's going to be Zillow, there's going to be other things. 
but you are going to be able to discount the value for quick sale value. The value of the property is going to be, the IRS understands that. You're putting a tax lien on it, you've got to sell it to pay the IRS. You're looking at a collection alternative. They're going to look, they're going to give you a 20% discount against the fair market value as the quick sale discount. Um, yes? I mean, look, it comes down, it, it's always a tough situation, right? The, the big, look at, there, there's recently, there, there, there's a town in New Jersey where a lot of people were recently arrested, okay? And one of the, the, the excuses for, you know, my clients who are there is, do you know how much money private school costs? And, so you know, if you've got three kids in private school and you're spending 75 grand a year, of course you can't pay your tax. But the public schools are free. So can people say, hey, I need to take care of my kids, my adult kids. I want to give them better than society gives them. Instead of a free public education, I want to give them this very expensive elite education. Is that okay and say, okay, we, you, you don't have to pay your taxes because we want to take care of your kids. Meanwhile, we're all paying real estate taxes in order to educate everybody's kids, right? It doesn't work that way, right? Everybody wants to take care of their kids, but you can't give your kids a house at the expense of the other taxpayers because wouldn't every parent want to give their kid a house, right? Or wouldn't I rather give, I'd like to give my kids a beach house that I could go visit instead of paying my tax. Is that going to work? You could try. Right? There are, the IRS, and that's the whole theory about the national standards. What are we working at? Right? The IRS balances the legitimate need to collect taxes against the hardship that it would cost the taxpayer, right? Is it a hardship if they take the beach house? Is it a hardship that the American taxpayer says, okay, you want to give your kids a house. Is it a hardship for you to pay your taxes? Or, again, and that, that's the balancing, right? Uh, some people would say, no, you should be able to take care of your kid's house. Other people would say, but that's why we pay real estate taxes, to give you know, everybody's kids a good education. You can't make ex extravagant personal choices at the expense of other hard work in American taxpayers. If they did that, then nobody would feel that the system was fair and you wouldn't get voluntary compliance self-assessment. Everybody's got to feel that we're all playing under the same rules. And it and that's what the government is supposed to do. They've got to they've got to convince us all that the system is fair. It's not rigged for the rich. It's not rigged for any you know special group that we all have the same obligations to the government when it comes to federal taxes. Frank for president. No, you absolutely, you would never want me as president. You don't, you don't want me in any political office. And the worst thing you could ever do is put me on the bench to be a judge. So, we need more jails. <laughs> They'd be tax jails. I'd be putting people in tax jail all the time. Well, maybe I'd do more forfeitures. <laughs> I could clean up that, that, that 180, give me, give me three years. I, I bring that 180 billion dollars down. <laughs> Automobiles. All right, again, mistake that people make all the time. All right. You put your car, 
how many how many cars do people need? A lot of people think, oh, I gotta have cars for each of my kids that are in school, and I'm gonna put the insurance in my name and the car in my name because it's cheaper to get the insurance that way. You think the IRS wants to see a 433 where you got five cars? All right. The kids gotta pay. if you owe taxes, the kids gotta pay for their own cars. All right. They, they can't they, afford BMWs. I know, it's so sad. <laughs> an American car. You're doing a 433. I want to see an American car on that 433. Don't show me no foreign cars. Yes? So on 433, with the car, I believe it's the ownership cost where you put the amount that they're paying for. Yeah. Um, what do you do if that's more than the standard? You eat it. All right? Because the national standards say this is what we're giving you for a automobile expense. You could go out and, and lease that, I think the new Porsche lease was $17.99 a month, right? The standard is $400 a month. They would say, you gotta find $1,400 someplace else and stay, still stay within the standards because you are not gonna live a luxury life at the other taxpayer's expense. Right? You can, the, the great thing about America is you can have anything you want that you can pay for. All right? But if you're asking everybody else to subsidize you, then that's what they're going to look at. They're going to say the average taxpayer living in the Northeast is going to have a car payment $3.99 or $4.99 a month, and that's got to cover your gas, and that's what you can have, and the IRS is going to say if you spend that, that's going to be allowed in your monthly expenses to keep. But if you want to spend more than that, you're free to do it. But you've got to find the money someplace else because you also got to pay your back tax, right? You can't zero out your income and say, all right, I, zero, I got nothing left at the end of the month because I live a really good life and I got nothing to pay tax with. I mean, I've got clients who tell me that's why they have no income. I had a client come in, I mean, literally, his definition was, I started the year. I had X number of dollars in the bank. I worked hard all year. I paid for this, I paid for that, I paid for this. At the end of the year, my bank balance was less than it was at the beginning of the year. I must have had no income. What? I don't need to go to an account to get my return prepared because I know that I didn't make any money this year. Look at my bank balance. Right? Is that the way it works? No. All right. Jewelry, again, you can value that. List it all. What are they going to look at? The insurance rider. All right. And so people say, oh, they're never going to know about my expensive jewelry or they're never going to know about my art. I had somebody with like a few million dollars in paintings. They were insured. <laughs> oh, so again, there's no percentage in line. Uh, that what does the IRM say? Are they going to double check everything? Actually, the IRM says, hey, we're going to trust you to value your own assets. All right? Unless it's crazy, right? the value that you are self-assessing, they're not going to verify the value of your assets, your jewelry, or whatever. right? Because 6334 exempts from levy the first $6,250. So I've never seen a 433 where anybody's valued their assets of more than 63, 62, 20, 50. And it's, the IRS never really challenges that, unless you have an asset or a liability on it. Um, what else? Personal assets. That, you know what? I, oh, maybe I'll go through the IET first. All right. What's included in household income? Household income. The non-liable party isn't responsible. So her income or doesn't come in. But when they pro, they're going to ex prorate expenses. <coughs> you do a 433 for if you got two people earning money, they're going to say, hey, the non-taxpayer, right, the non-tax debtor doesn't live for free. So you've got to allocate your income in the household between the tax debtor and the non-tax debtor, right? They're not going to say the tax, the non-tax debtor should pay all the household expenses, but they're not going to say they get a free ride on the United States government. So the way they do that is you take total household income, total expenses, and then you allocate between the two, and then you do the 433. All right, so you look at what shared expenses are, and that's basically what I said.
So say you, you divide house, household income, you got one that earns 9,000, one that earns 2,000, 77% of the expenses would be allowable, right? Uh, gross, and remember gross and cash value. Do not, uh, everything that you earn goes into your income. Phantom income, money that you don't receive, right? You, you get a K-1. And there's money that it's non-deductible expenses, so it's not an actual cash that goes into the bank account. Doesn't get counted when you do a 433. So you're gonna do the 433 based on the actual amount that's deposited into the bank account in order to back out the phantom income, right? The 433 is a cash basis document. So that, and that's a mistake that people make, right? They're gonna include income that actually doesn't get paid out to them on the 433, and that's gonna distort all the numbers, right? You're in a partnership, you're in a K-1, it doesn't distribute, but the, the income is gonna be distributed, I mean, allocated to you anyway. You gotta adjust all of that to cash basis. And the way you do that is you deposit everything in the bank account and show what's actually went into the bank account backing out non-recurring sources of revenue and non, like, ta loans and gifts. Uh, right, then W-2 income, what else are they? Interest in dividends, again, if it's going into the bank, it can be uh, on the 433. The IRS is gonna check the W and I. So you, know, you have to report at least the interest income that is showing on a W and I. Net business income, again, net, not gross business income goes on line 89, page six, right? So it's the amount the taxpayer earned after paying the ordinary and necessary business expenses. The caveat is you don't double take the expenses. What I see a lot of professionals trying to do is they net out an expense on the business, saying it doesn't go on the income line, and then they try to take the expense, again, on the individual expense line. Expenses, so the, the example is, they take the car as an expense against business income, and then they take the same car again as an individual expense. You never get to double count an expense. And there are lots of expenses in closely held businesses that can go either way. It can either go on the business or it can go on the individual. You don't get to double count. Um, so if your income is losing money, the IRS doesn't let you net one business against another, so you're always at zero. So there are times when, when that computation comes up, you may want to take income off an A and put it on a B, because that does allow for the the netting of income from different businesses. So again, knowing how things look in presentation is important in knowing what the monthly cash flow is gonna be for purposes of the IET. Uh, probably, same thing, net rental income. You back out depreciation because it's not a cash expense uh, to come up with the net rental income. Uh, distributions, again, only cash, not uh, phantom distributions on line 25. So security goes on as additional income, but when you're doing your collection alternative, you can remind them 6334 doesn't allow them to, well, they do, so security can be levied, I'm sorry. That is the disability that they shouldn't levy. Um, what else, I wanna go through, all right. I think child support, again, you don't put the child support on because the and child support is one of those things where the custodial parent, on the other hand, gets not the custodial parent, the non-custodial parent paying child support is allowed to deduct the child support on the expense side, right? Because you don't have that cash. You're, you've got a court order. You've got to pay child support. The IRS is not going to say, "Hey, pay us instead of paying your child support." So child support is one of those things where it may not be included on the, the receiving side, but it's gonna be the payor side as a court-ordered payment. And I think this is probably a good place to break, where we're gonna break here. Other income, again, cash, cash, cash. Remember, reoccurring income. Non-occurring, reoccurring income, like gambling, like uh, 
one-time sales, you're going to put in your other income, but you're going to take it out of your, your calculation of monthly expenses because it will skew the expense. Same thing when you are when you have one good year, you're going to think about the rules that let you average so that your payments are not going to be based on the high year. Um, and this is a perfect place. We will start part two when we get to national standard expenses. 10 minute break? No, now we're done. You can go home now early. But there's going to be a test next time. We're going to start part one of collections right now. Collections, and you guys got the outlines today, right? Yep. How, do you see how long you got in those outlines? I mean, Jeff and Larry Senecandro put it all together. There's over 250 pages, kind of like a textbook on collection. Right? Even though we're going to have six hours, you know, three now and three uh, next month, it doesn't even scratch the surface of what you need to know to represent a taxpayer in a collection case. Uh, so just know that. Read the materials. There is a lot there. Okay, now, I want to, you got to thank Jeff, you got to thank Larry Sanicandro, the people who put everything together, and Mike, you know, where's Mr. Wallace, is in the back, he helped to put all of this together, um, so, it is a lot. Okay, now, let me start us up. Why is this such a busy area? Why is there so much going on, right? The IRS little book tells you a stat. How many cases are currently in collection? Their ending inventory is now over 14 million cases. That means there are 14 million taxpayers, individuals and corporations, who owe money to the United States government. All right. Look at the number of zeros on the assessed tax penalty and interest. That looks like 138 billion dollars in account receivable. Um, so that's why there is a lot of work out there. I mean, and a lot to know because nobody rationally believes that the IRS is going to collect all of it. Nobody rationally believes that you can get 14 million taxpayers who are not in compliance to pay everything they owe in the back. How many levies and liens? 470 million notices of federal tax lien, right? Uh, 896 million levies, 436,000 seizures in 2016. Yeah, just so you know, I mean, there's a there's a lot to do. I mean, what is uh, what's a levy? What's it? Levy is taking people's bank accounts taking people's pension plans, seizures, that's taking people's property, right? Whether it's taking people's businesses, taking people's houses, I think you, you saw on the internet, they, they recently seized a dress bill uh, business and sold the dresses out at an auction. Uh, the IRS is now gonna be selling stuff online, right? There's gonna be an Amazon.com for IRS seizures. Free shipping. <laughs> They're actually proud of that. <laughs> um, because, you know, they're taking all this stuff. You saw the numbers. They're taking all this stuff. They got to sell it. They got to sell it efficiently. They got to sell it fast. So soon, coming to you soon, is, you know, irs.gov. Let me bid on somebody else's misery. <laughs> all right, so what do you got to do? Uh, now, we're going to go through the big picture, and then we're going to go through nuts and bolts. So we're going to start on the big picture. All right, taxpayer comes in and says, I owe money to the IRS. All right, taxpayers are different, right? Some taxpayers, I owe $10,000 to the IRS, it's the end of their work, right? And that's why you see the infomercials, pennies on a dollar, you owe $10,000, call us. Other people, they owe a million dollars, they sleep like a baby. <laughs> right? So the first thing you do is, is you gotta define the problem. Is it new tax, is it old tax? Uh, and you got to you got to develop a questionnaire, right? To send the clients, interview the taxpayer, 
get all of the correspondence, right? Where are we in the process? Is it a shoebox that the tax fair has ignored everything for years? Or is it something new that we're in time to make certain requests? Um, in addition to what the taxpayer says you get a 2848, get the uh, W9 and the account transcripts. Get them back for 10 years, the 10 year statute of limitations. Is this a new problem? Is this a problem that's been going on for years? Um, get, get a retainer letter. These cases all take longer than you think they're going to take. Everybody calls and it comes in, this is just a little problem. Right? It's not just a little problem. And then get a Freedom of Information Act. So get the IRS's entire file. Because tax, invariably, taxpayers who owe tax don't keep everything. Right? They don't always open their mail. Some of them move. And you want the taxpayer's file. So that's the step one. Gather the facts. Define the problem. Step two in every in one of these cases is, does the taxpayer really owe the tax, right? Uh, for the federal government, sometimes taxpayers don't pay tax. They don't file returns. And the IRS sends notices of deficiency, right? Have you all seen notices of deficiency that come from the service center? What happens when somebody sells stock? What basis do they give you? Zero. So if you actually got the basis, many of these notices go down to zero, right? Um, so there's lots of arbitrary assessments. More and more, there are 1099s that are sent by people that are wrong, right? Staffing companies, they get the wrong social security numbers, they send you income on 1099s and W-2 that your taxpayers didn't get. Um, and those are in the notices of deficiency. So you've got to verify even the information reports. Uh, 1099 cancellation of indebtedness, right? Those are, the year is wrong. The, the cancellation of indebtedness is supposed to be the year that the taxpayer uh, is no longer able to pay. You know, when, when the, the property's been sold, when there's an identifiable event. When did the bank send you the 1099? When they need the deduction on their side, which is totally irrelevant to when the taxpayer's got to pick it up. So sometimes you're going to be fighting the, the, the 1099 COD, the discharge of indebtednesses, uh, third party information reports. Uh, there are times that it's just the IRS is going to be out of statute, right? There, in the outline you'll see there's three years to make an assessment, there's uh, 10 years to collect. Sometimes you're going to receive these notices that the right thing to do is you look at the transcripts and say, right back to the IRS, please abate this tax, you're out of time. You either assess too late or you're still collecting. Uh, they're going to say, hey, we think we had an extension of time. But in many of these cases, you're going to say, they destroyed the administrative file. They, they don't have a copy of the extension of time extending either the assessment statute or the collection statute. Sometimes that simple request for abatement of the tax is going to make the case go away. Okay? So verify the assessment. Next, are all or any of your prepayment challenges to the assessment still intact? Right. The IRS has a publication 7804, audit reconsideration. You're going to get the shoebox. The taxpayer never answered. Should they pay more tax just because they didn't answer the IRS notices? Right? The IRS has procedures for that, both the audit reconsideration and the offer and compromise doubt as to liability. Uh, and all of these things, these are overviews. Don't, you don't have to worry about all of these. They're covered in the material, or I'm going to be covering them. I'm just giving you the overview of how many different things you could do when a taxpayer comes in to you saying, hey, the IRS is trying to collect tax from me. All right. So there's audit recon, offer and compromise, amended returns. Frequently, to, I, either the IRS prepared a return for you or a tax preparer who shouldn't have been preparing returns prepared returns for you. Amended returns are sometimes the answer to eliminate and reduce the tax liability. Um, penalty abatement requests, you know, the, the, many of these cases, the penalty and interest exceeds the tax. So you have to evaluate, hey, is this a good candidate for a penalty abatement? 
interest debate, right? Mike Wallace wrote an article that was in the newsletter. You know, the uh, biggest lie the IRS is in, there's nothing we can do to help you, right? There's lots they can do to help you. So understand all the interest abatement rules. Um, then there is innocent spouse relief. Just because the taxpayer signed a joint return doesn't necessarily mean that that taxpayer is forever bound to the liability on that return. Explore whether or not the, the taxpayer can be relieved from liability based on the innocent spouse statutes. Um, and then trust fund recovery penalty abatement. So there are lots of prepayment challenges to the assessment that the IRS made. And again, before we start getting involved in the collection alternatives and paying in tax and deciding and making an offer of how much tax to pay, first see what you can do to whittle down the assessment. It's a lot easier to whittle down and make a compromise of a $10,000 claim than it is a billion dollar claim. Then it's fact finding. All right, once you, you looked at that, there's a lot of information available. You know, the, the taxpayer has probably already missed opportunities by the time you are getting the case. So this is a measure twice complex. You need to get the facts so that you can go to the IRS and say, look, there's been an injustice here. Our client did not you know, respond when he should have, but these are the facts that will let you get to the right thing, right answer. Taxpayer Bill of Rights number three. Every taxpayer has the right to pay only the correct amount of tax. Right. So what are you going to do? One, you get the information from the taxpayer. Two, you download your transcripts of account. Understand the transcripts, right? Most people, the first time, they look at all these codes and they give up. The IRS has a transcript pocket guide that helps you understand the transcript. You can download it from their website. Understand what every code on that transcript means. Um, do your FOIAs. Get credit reports from the clients, right? Uh, they help you understand things, right? A client who's behind on all those credit cards, that supports the, the delinquency and the non-payment of the IRS. But I mean, when you see a client who's paying 10,000 a month off on the credit card, they're always in time, but they're coming to you, but their tax debt isn't paid. You gotta ask some questions. What's going on here? The story doesn't make sense. Um, and you, your credibility is everything when you go to the government on collection alternatives. Um, also, you, you do searches on the client. Um, why do you do searches on the client? Clients give you truth on the installment basis, right? The public record searches show either lawsuits, homes, automobiles, boats. I mean, for a, for a while I was getting like, every taxpayer owed money had a boat. So the correlation was, you buy a boat, you're gonna owe the IRS money. Um, but you wanna know these things because the IRS says, your guy's got a boat. Uh, so you, you complete the 433, and if you're, the IRS has a nice little tool on its website called the Offer and Compromise Pre-Qualifier. And that Offer and Compromise Pre-Qualifier is gonna help you know what's the minimum order that the IRS would take. And it's also gonna tell you whether or not you should even bother going down the road of an offer. And there's some computations that you have to let you figure out what your installment agreement request should be. So, and this one is free. Every, you're, you're all probably getting lots of software, uh, um, emails about Pitbull and tax tools and all of the canopy and all these services that'll help you do it. And sure, they're all great. Uh, the, the one on the IRS's website, it's free and it's great too. Um, then you, you figure that out. So, Five. Now, before you offer the IRS money, let's evaluate. I'm gonna go down this road. Collection alternatives with the IRS are mostly long-term. They're, they're gonna be offers and compromise. You compromise the debt with the IRS, you gotta be good for five years after the offer, otherwise it all comes back. Installment agreements are long-term. They've generally been going now for the length of the statute of limitations, which is 10 years. Right. Before you do that to a non-compliant taxpayer, Evaluate whether or not the taxpayer could just file bankruptcy and get it over with. Most taxpayers don't want to file for bankruptcy. But most taxpayers, we know that they're never going to be current for five years. They're not disciplined enough to do it. 
So unless you're willing to babysit them for the rest of either the statute of limitations or the five years on an offer, bankruptcy is better as a collection alternative for some taxpayers than the offer and compromise of the long-term installment grant. Not saying it's the right answer in all cases. If you can get a taxpayer to become voluntary compliant, self-assessing, you know, all of these collection alternatives are great, but you're not going to be able to change them, right? You're not going to change their lives or their character. You are going to change their lives. Innocent spouse, the first time you get somebody innocent spouse, they're going to hug you, they're going to love it. You know, they're, they're actually grateful, but um, money problems are money problems. People don't want to change their lifestyles to be able to pay all of their debts. And once they get into the habit of not paying IRS debt, it becomes a habit. But, so look at bankruptcy as your collection alternative. Then the last step is understand all the collection alternatives and which one suits your client. One size doesn't fit all. You've got some poor clients, the people that I ask you to volunteer for. Some of them have all of their properties exempt from levy. There's nothing the IRS could do because they have nothing that the government can take. So you need to know 6334 and what the IRS can take and what they can't take. Um, you've got to know, and so you combine that with property exempt from levy and currently not collectible. If the payment of any amount would result in a hardship, then the IRS can mark an account currently not collectible. Currently not collectible doesn't extend the statute of limitations. So if the taxpayer really is down and out, and he's not gonna, you don't foresee the taxpayer getting better, you currently not collectible. I can't pay is an acceptable collection alternative. And the courts have said that. Um, installment agreements. I can't pay the whole thing, but this is what I can pay, and there's a 10 year statute of limitations, so I'm gonna pay you within the statute, or alternatively, if you give me a payment plan, I can full pay within the statute. So there's the full payment installment.